great pleasure to be here. Uh, it comes at a really amazing time for healthcare because it's clear that genomic sequencing is going to make a huge change. Now, Gordon Sangera says he likes to be a disruptive influence on technology and human affairs. And something in me is attracted to that. But in my current role, which is now a, partly a civil servant, I've got to see this more as an enabling process. Can you take this technology and turn it to a really constructive and purposeful use? And honestly, we're at a stage now where what we're going to do, and you've seen examples of it, even with plants, where it's going to make a huge difference. It's going to make an unprecedented difference to the way that we practice infectious diseases, communicable diseases, not only for humans, but probably for animals and plants as well. And we're going to garner information that hitherto has been inaccessible to us in practice. And I'm going to try and take you through that today. And it, what are the actual ingredients that we really need to be able to deliver that difference? And there are a few. And these are really a very major focus of mine because I've been asked in Public Health England to rebase the technology for communicable disease in England. And a similar challenge has been put out to the CDC Atlanta. And not only is the technology, change, technology going to change the practice in those public health enterprises, but simultaneously it's going to provide the information that's going to change the practice of infectious disease and large parts of medicine. And what do we need? We need a cost-efficient, accurate solution providing same-day results. Okay, so this is not like research. We're traversing from doing work in retrospect to providing information for action every day as fast as you possibly can. So that's, in a sense, a little bit different from a lot of the talks that have been given. So the focus is going to be on something that can be introduced through the regulatory hurdles that will be used, no doubt, in five to ten years, virtually everybody's still alive in this audience. And what we really need is something that processes and produces the information, the total information, in about six hours to really become the transform, tr transformative technology. You have to be able to extract from a sample rapidly, and we've seen examples of that, you need a sample prep that is fast. You need a very fast sequencer. And we've just, Joe, you illustrated that very nicely in a field. You need rapid data processing and analysis, which is coming. And what hasn't been mentioned, but is critical for delivering medical solutions, and particularly those in infectious disease and in a pathology laboratory, is random access. So every next sample that comes in, you can put it on a machine, and you don't have to hold it and wait for a batch, which builds in a delay in delivering a sample. Okay. Critically for the functions that we're going to need for infectious diseases, you're going to require of the technology the capability of sequencing very low concentrations, Prob probably somewhere around about 1,000 genomic copies of a bacterium, which turns out to be about 0.1 of a nanogram. So tiny amounts. And you need to get high quality, complete information. So Illumina gives us fantastic information, but it's not complete. And we've had lovely examples of that in the various talks. And obviously, like for plant sequencing, you want something that's portable. Because ultimately, you want to take the labs to where the patients are. So they talk about this as near to patient testing. And I'll give you an example of that. And w if it's lightweight and it's compact, you're in a fantastic position as you were going into the sort of northern Wales. And critically, I haven't heard anything mentioned about this, but cost 
in healthcare becomes vital. And if you're going to get a re replacement technology, it can't add cost in most domains in the world now. It's got to be cost neutral. And I suspect you, the cost of a genome, when it's around about $20, probably something ONT doesn't like to hear, is probably going to be the cost point where it just organically happens. It won't even have to be marketed. And one of the key output species identification, I think, in, it's the same in everything. It's cop, copper bottom, to use your, your word for it. It's, it's the most powerful way of doing it. And then for each species, critically, in infectious disease, you're going to want to extract from the data re, uh, antimicrobial resistance. You're going to need to be able to predict that. And other features, there'll be microorganisms with particular toxins that you would like to recover and record. And for public health purposes, to recognize outbreaks and therefore identify nearest, nearest matches genomically, that's a critical component and has been beautifully illustrated by Nick Lohman and others in the work on Ebola in Guinea. And something I think that's self-evident and again was evident uh, Germain, to your point about plants, is you can need a persistent database. But here, for every single organism that's been previously sequenced. So you're navigating into the world of really massive data. Okay, what are our challenges and the, and the way ahead? I'm going to give you two use cases that I think illustrate the two extremes that one would like to solve. And they are using genome sequencing to characterize enterobacteriaceae, in particular those that are carbapenemase resistance. Now, what are carbapenemase? They're a class of beta-lactam antibiotic. Beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin, cephalosporins. What is curious about this particular molecule, it is extraordinarily active against virtually all genera of bacteria. So it's seen as the antidote to any infection and was the mainstay in a sense of treating people with severe infection where you didn't know what caused it, particularly in a hospital setting. And resistance has emerged to that. I'll take you through that. And the other is mycobacterial, which is the genus in which you find TB. And they represent two contrasting examples of what we need to, 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 to demonstrate success in. And I'll cover some of the technology advances that are needed. Okay. The global distribution of carbapenemases, they weren't any obvious 10 years ago. Okay. In the space of 10 years, there are a number of enzymes that have emerged. These are uh, encoded by different genes. There's one that's NDM which was discovered in India about 2009. And there's one KPC enzyme that was discovered in North Carolina 2006, I think it was. Might have been earlier than that. And very rapidly, they've spread to be cosmopolitan around the world. But not surprising, the NDM, which was first observed in India, dominates in India. And KPC, which was first observed in North Carolina, dominates in the United States, but it's dispersed. It's been unclear how those genes have dispersed so rapidly, but this is at an international scale. If you look at the context of England alone, in, since 2008 through till now, a number of other genes, there's KPC, NDM, but there are a number of other genes that hydrolyze the carbapenem molecule and inactivated have become increasingly prevalent. If you <coughs> produce a heat map for all the years across England, up in the northeast, there's a particular problem and concentration of KPC. Around the Thames Valley, there's a problem with NDM, relatively speaking. And with another enzyme, VIM, there's a problem up in and around the Wirral. 
and the distributions have become uneven, but nonetheless, it, they're becoming highly prevalent in various locales. We have a particularly useful example of the emergence and dispersal of KPC in a single hospital, which is a UVA hospital in Charlottesville, Virginia, which was first observed in 2007, around about September 2007. So the initial observation was made then and was tracked thereafter. So there was a single point introduction and it could be followed through over a number of years. And somewhat unexpectedly, a, this KPC resistance was observed in a wide range of genera that had not been observed elsewhere. It tended to remain uh, confined to Clipsiella pneumonia of a particular lineage, a sequence type 258. But nonetheless, it became highly dispersed amongst many genera over the, what's it, five-year period. If you e examine the diversity across all those genera and, and define it as being at least 500 SNPs distant from another, there was no change over time. So there was an inexhaustible diversity, as it were, in the population, or the diversity was continuing to increase over time. So you, it, in this rarefaction plot, you weren't getting an, a, 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 a reduction in the diversity in an asymptote apparent. That was a somewhat of a surprise. And so we asked the question about what might explain that best of all. And we'd done Illumina sequencing and had been unable to deconvolute the plasmid structures and other episomal structures, and we chose to sequence only 17 using PacBio and identified 80 closed plasmids amongst those 17, 11 of them containing the KPC gene. So there was this extraordinary diversity within the population, represented by only a subset of 17. And nevertheless, it gave us greater clarity of the relationships between the organisms and an explanatory for how this was spreading across multiple genera. And all of these were conjugative plasmids. And some of them were highly prevalent across the populations and other of them were quite rare. So there was an enormous dynamic in the population. As a single experiment to explore whether you could recover that variation amongst the plasmid population, we took six. By the way, I didn't mention that the previous samples were, were, were assembled using a hybrid uh, uh, assembly of PAC bio sequence data, read data, and Illumina data. And we then performed a Menin sequencing on six isolates, those that represented the most uh, a diverse set of plasmids. And we got <coughs> seven closed plasmids and 16 distinct plasmids amongst these six isolates that co-correlated with the PAC bio sequence data and the hybrid assemblies produced a, an accuracy of 99.97, 99.8, which I heard mentioned earlier today a number of times. So we got high accuracy assemblies, albeit uh, uh, um, hy hybrid assemblies using Illumina data to polish those. So we, and this represents the phylogenetic relationships between all the different species and annotated by the plasmids and the particular transposons in which the KPC gene was associated. And this provided enormous clarity about the diversity within the population of KPC producing organisms, one of the most feared uh, multi-resistant organisms in hospitals. So what does this mean? This took us 18 months to investigate using Illumina sequencing and PAC bio sequencing 
and work between Virginia, Oxford, and New York. And as has been mentioned by many other people before, you can foresee and envision bringing the small, compact sequencer right near to the patient and undertake sequencing. It's clear that the time taken to produce useful sequence data, and these were using R, R7 um, uh, 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 cassettes, we were able to, in the space of about eight hours, produce sufficient data to close genomes. So we're getting close in terms of numbers. I think if we go to TB, TB is a huge global problem. There are two billion people infected. Amazingly, over the last 16 years, no, 26 years, there's been almost a 50% reduction in TB. Nonetheless, there's still 10 million new case cases a year about 40% are undiagnosed, which is, in its own right is quite a, 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 a continuing threat to certain regions of the world, India, <coughs> China, and Southeast Asia, in that those unrecognized cases of, are the source for further onward transmission. About half a million are multi-resistant, but yet more of those are undiagnosed thereby leaving a larger subset available to infect people with, with multi-resistant strains. And about 1.5 million people died. So this has led the World Health Organization to continue to pursue a plan to eliminate TB as a public health problem by 2030. And for this, the aim is to initiate better and faster diagnostics. That means more complete uh, 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 characterization of organisms. The aim is to rapidly identify cases of TB. And one of the major initiatives of the World Health Organization is to develop fast, lightweight, portable sequencing, rapid pre preparation from sputum, and rapid resistance prediction. And this is seen to be the mainstay of the elimination program globally. And the aim is to manage, manage every case effectively. Every single case around the world is going to get a case manager designated, even in poor countries, supported by funding by the Gates Foundation and other major uh, sources. And there is an enormously intensive program underway. In the UK, particularly in England, we've already in the process of implementing whole genome sequencing as, as the diagnostic solution for TB. And this is done by extracting from a, a liquid culture. It is an Illumina sequence, sequencer that's used. We identify species, pr produce a prediction of resistance, and identify nearest neighbors. This takes two to five days to process. However, the, it takes about one to two weeks to grow up the organism. So it takes up to three weeks to get a result out. We've now successfully developed a very simple, extremely cheap method of extracting TB DNA from a sputum sample. And this is Tonya Wojtenseva, who's done this work. We get equivalent yields as you do from a liquid culture, from the direct samples. And it takes about three hours. And, and we only choose to do it on, on samples that are known to be as, as what's called smear positive. That means that on the gram stain equivalent that they do for TB, you can see the, the mycobacteria. And about 50% of the, the reads that are produced are human or other bacterial. Nonetheless, at 50%, there's still enough to do resistance prediction. We're doing quite a lot of work with 
oxygen nanopore to reduce the amount of input DNA and still successfully sequence. And we got around about five nanograms. We need to get to a tenth of that to re reliably produce sequence, I would say. And anything above five nanograms, we were able to predict resistance and predict the species of the mycobacteria in the samples. How would you enrich for the relevant re reads? We're working with Matt Luce on in-pore filtering and run until to enrich for the relevant reads so that we would have a far higher probability of successfully calling resistance and species. There's a huge effort going on to identify all the variants that confer antimicrobacterial resistance. We've been funded by the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust to create a very large international consortium that will be sequencing upwards of 100,000 TB to, to exhaustively identify the, the, the resistance determinants, which then can be queried uh, in each and every isolate coming through. We're working to implement a near real-time uh, diagnostic service in a high instance area of the world. We're in discussions with people in Mumbai, and the aim is to produce results on the same day, direct from a sputum, and we would expect to be pr processing about 200 samples per day. And in identifying resistant isolates, you can offer people personalized treatment. The current way of doing it is a PCR, and if they suspect resistance from scoring resistance on one gene, encoding resistance when there are 17 genes available for 17 different drugs to uh, 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 determine resistance, patients are then put on eight highly toxic drugs if they score positive. If you're able to identify all the determinants, you'd be able to offer personalized treatment for a patient, but you'd need to do it very rapidly. It would also allow one to identify hotspots of transmission, which would then be the foci of public health intervention. And the question is, can this be delivered by ONT? Well, Zan Iqbal, who gave a talk at one of the workshops earlier, is putting a great deal of effort into fast processing and analysis uh, to do this. And this is his little video of micro predictor. And I'll give you some sense. If you're seeing a patient with TB, you will examine them. You will get a sputum on day one and say, we suspect you've got TB. And then say, would you come back next week? We'll have further results. Come back next week, they get a re result for example, indicating resistance in one of the genes to rifampicin, which is one of the drugs that's used, and that means that they put on to treatment for multi-resistant TB, which could be up to eight drugs simultaneously. They get admitted, and they are highly uh, uh, resist, um, toxic drugs. And the opportunity to gather the information rapidly, as has just been demonstrated here. So isoniz it, you know that it's resistance, rifampicin it's resistance, and resistance to those, but you know that it's susceptible to ethambutol, perizinamide, and quinolones, and therein lies what would be personalized treatment you could give a patient there and then within 48 hours of making the diagnosis. What will lead to a rapid replacement of routine diagnostic microbiology. So if you can recover all the knowledge and, and, and understanding of multi-resistance in Enterobacteriaceae, which are arguably the most difficult organisms to characterize, and you can do TB, which is one of the more difficult organisms to manipulate and definitely very slow to grow, you probably have the ingredients to replace all of clinical microbiology. And there are going to be three requirements to do this. You're going to need speed, which I've emphasized. You're going to need accuracy. And for ONT, Gordon promises me now that it's going to be highly reproducible, highly quality assured by the end of this year. Because in running a clinical service, you can't have 
poorly performing sequence reactions that give you false results. So you've got to have reproducibility and reliability on a far higher scale than has been achievable so far. And it needs to be cost neutral. All of this assumes there's going to be an underlying application software which remains to be coded and available to use. I've got a huge number of people to thank. Um, they run right across an international community and, and, and elsewhere. And I suspect in two years' time, we're going to be, I, I genuinely believe this, given what I've heard at this talk here and what has been said by others, navigating towards a world where clinical microbiology is replaced by whole genome sequencing and most of the information is going to be available in a day or two of taking a sample. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. I'm sure we have questions. One here from the front. Hi, I'm from India, and we are doing the sequencing of uh, uh, tuberculosis using uh, iron proton and uh, Illumina sequencers where they have subsidized. So we are doing it at $1.50 per sample. So maybe if uh, it takes a week's time for us to do the sequencing, maybe if uh, nanopores can give it us a subsidized price, we can do that for uh, that price, I guess. It's possible. There you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? We actually can't start the next section for another five minutes. <laughs> so, three more questions just appeared. Fantastic. Uh, those plasmids you identified were quite large, so I, I suspect they're carrying multiple drug resistance determinants on each plasmid, and there may be multiple plasmids within a strain, and then within a particular patient, you can have a whole zoo of infectious agents. Uh, how, because of that, do you think you, even with this sequencing, you'd actually be able to identify sort of the rare variants in the population to be able to clear the infection rather than just selecting for something that's kind of a needle in the haystack in the infection. Can I just phrase the way that, that I understood you asking, if you get single isolates, can you identify plasmids and rare variants of that single isolate, or are you asking a metagenomic question? Well, it, metagenomic in the fact, not a single isolate, but in a sputum sample, you're gonna have a mixed population and you're going to see the highest prevalent organism in terms of the resistance genes that it carries. And is it a problem then when you know they're carrying multiple disease resistance that you just select out? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the major problems with, with, with metagenomics and, and making inference about uh, 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 prevalence of a particular characteristic in the population that could be present in very, very uh, small minority populations, absolutely. TB is really interesting because in the directly sequenced isolates, you can see minority variants that have resistance mutations present at 2 to 5% of the population sequence. Exactly. And that is a predictor of resistance emerging on therapy. And we, we know that. Question from you and just so what in, in this future where we're doing this um, in many many locations uh, what is going to be the opportunity and the challenge for that knowledge base of resistance uh, across the world because in some sense it's going to be great but do you feel we've got the right structures set up to um, leverage that kind of it's going to be streaming real time into ideally a centralized system, right? I mean, you, you've kind of answered the question that, that to have, it, it, it actually raises, a, in public health, many of the questions that emerge are of an ethical nature. So what is the ethics around having privileged information about resistance held in 
it, it, it concealed from the wider population. You can't possibly entertain that. So this becomes information that's going to be held and in a way that's freely available to the world, fact one. Second of all, you're going to have a way of extracting from that data the relevant information so that you can use it purposefully. So there has to be a whole program of activity. So this big grant that we've been awarded aims at achieving some of it. It will not provide the answer. It may give you some of the tools to recover the valuable information that will be needed. But there needs to be a persistence of that store, as I said. You need to have persistence of stores. And there needs to be bilateral, trilateral, multilateral agreements and understanding about how that data is going to be made available. I do not have the answer. People know there needs to be an answer. And it needs to be done. Hi, Derek. Um, I guess my question is quite closely related, because I was thinking once um, diagnosis uh, in clinical microbiology just turns into whole genome sequencing, then we're generating tens or hundreds of thousands of complete genomes every year. Where are those going to go? Are they going to get dropped after the diagnosis has been done? Well, I mean, what, there's one question about drug resistance mutations, and there being a centralised database about that. But the actual whole genomes themselves, uh, let's say, you know, there's uh, a country somewhere in Europe that has... Uh, it, does each country going to kind of keep, or each health service going to keep their own genomes? Where's... So we've got a precedent with the <laughs> HIV resistance screening database no, that's very no, much no, no. kept behind a wall in a, in a closed garden. Or is everything going to be dumped into GenBank? It, I think the... most people accept there needs to be open access with some safeguards. Some of the safeguards include, for example, in putting up pathogen data, you want to avoid including sufficient human data there to identify a person. So you don't want to have cardinality in the data so that you can identify somebody. It'll be embarrassing, you'll be found out, and it'll undermine the good efforts to make data generally available, which is essentially the answer. This data needs to be available, but there are going to be technical issues about how you store it, how you can interrogate it, because it's going to be vast amounts of data. For instance, Public Health England well, if it's sequenced everything it gets and then you extend that to the NHS and they sequence every microorganism that's cultured and thought to be important in disease, be it a virus, bacterium, fungus, parasite, you're going to be getting three, four million organisms uh, a year, 10 years, 30 million, carry it around the world, you're going to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of million uh, of, 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 of organisms stored. And how you make effective use of that, I don't pretend to know. Wouldn't but I know it's going to be an interesting problem. Wouldn't a private healthcare provider, say, in the States, want to keep hold of that as proprietary? You know, they've paid to generate that information. Why would they well, have they any would. incentive to put it in the public domain? I, you know, I'm totally with you. I want it in the public domain. But the NHS is, in I, the sense, know, a fairly special case. I think when you've got case. sparse data, it has value. When you get vast amounts of data generally available, the value of keeping it and preserving it and and holding it becomes a lot less, I would assume. I don't know about that. Because Can you the, foresee? Value, the value will be also about the time point and the place where you collected it. In other words, the metadata that each thing gets tagged with will be as, it's like satellite images. You know, we can take pictures of the Earth now. It doesn't mean that we throw away the pictures of the Earth from 1969. They're less good, but the whole point is that they were from 1969. I, I agree there's going to be a metadata issue, and it's the, it's the richness of the metadata that there'll be a debate about. It yeah, comes, it comes to this. And, but, you, and, and you, can compress, going, you can compress the, the raw data quite well. At okay. least I hope you can. Uh, so I don't think the data volume should scare us. If that's OK in your yeah. view. Well, then it's doable. And if it's doable, <laughs> we should work hard to achieve it. Metadata will be a problem. I, I, had, I thought purely of the genomic, but the metadata, the audience here, even from, from the UK, won't understand that there's a facility now for information governance around patient information. And that is governed by a set of statutory arrangements and guidance, and a lot of the guidance is organized by somebody called Fiona Caldicott. And the latest guidance looks like it's going to offer 
opt out to people, and it is assumed something like 15, 20% of the population in the UK is going to opt out of providing their personal health care record data to national databases. Very interesting effect. One last question here, and then I think we're over. Oh. David, go um, you've, you've talked about excluding human data, but what if um, there's something in the human genome which um, confers susceptibility to TB infection or maybe um, helps to create the resistance? Sorry, what's the, the question? Um, yeah. Would you consider including the human data if it were discovered that um, something in the human genome was encouraging susceptibility? So, so the, there's a whole ethical framework about storing human data and it needs individual patient consent. So if you've got individual patient consent, of course you can store it, because that would be, that would be part of the consenting process. But to store human data without individual patient consent is against the law. I mean, I lose my medical license, and you, you can be criminally charged, actually. It's a serious offence. Thank you very much Thanks. indeed. Thank you. Thank you.